Hey, this is Latif Mikado, and you're listening to the Good Night Freestyle Podcast, where I take some time each night to try and reflect on the freestyle scene, where it is, where it's going, and try to figure out how to sustain it, not just for future generations to enjoy, but also to benefit. So sit back, relax, and let's talk some freestyle. Hey, what's up, everyone? It's Latif, and welcome to the Good Night Freestyle Podcast. And this is episode 90. That's right, 90. Pretty, um, pretty great accomplishment, I feel. Um, if I didn't get so many messages and a few phone calls... Uh, from you guys, I probably would have stopped. I probably would have stopped. Think about it. Um, I didn't need a lot. I didn't need 100, 200. I don't have them. I have maybe a dozen, two dozen at the most. Well, I think the most I've seen listening at one time was like 48 people. So not a lot, but this is the beauty with the podcast. It's like YouTube. They build in time. You know, so you don't need to have an immediate um, following or immediate um, <clears throat> listenership. That happens in time. So, like YouTube, YouTube, you could put a video out, and for the first week, it got three plays or three likes. You come back to it next year, and you got 400. So, I have some videos of mine that are in the thousands on my YouTube. So, the beauty about the podcast is it, it documents is what it's doing. It's basically my diary. It's, and I'm letting you guys in on it. And I'm letting you in on it because there are things that I'm going to do and I want to do. And anyone who knows me or has followed me knows that I do things. I do get things done. I have books and I've done, I've done quite a few things. So I have some projects that I'm working on and that now of course I got sidetracked a little bit but which is fine which is fine it gives me it gives me a little time to kind of look back at what I'm doing um but I have some really cool projects towards the freestyle genre some great ideas uh, that I want to implement now I've done I've had some pretty good ideas in the past and I've implemented them and they've been somewhat successful if they weren't successful financially they were definitely popular okay things like when I did the SAL when I did the Freestyle Music Awards uh, my books my vlogs um, you know things like that uh, people have gravitated to and they, they get it they understand it they, they see what I'm trying to do but I have a few other projects that can actually open up quite a few doors for quite a few people, especially if you have an interest in the genre. Now, now, I've been an entrepreneur pretty much my whole life. I worked for a record company because I wanted the experience. That was it. Other than that, I didn't want to work there. I didn't want a, a nine to five. Um, it just wasn't me. It just wasn't me. Um, and it was one of my biggest fears when I came out of prison. Because I went in as a kid. I, I actually celebrated my 21st birthday in the penitentiary. And it was crazy because, <clears throat> I think I brought this up once before, but um, they came to my cell like maybe 6 o'clock in the morning. They, they knocked on my cell door with, uh, with um, a stick. You know, like, da, 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 Mikado. I was like, yeah, happy birthday. Come on, follow me. And they cracked the cell. And they, they let me out. And I followed the CL. I remember it was still dark. I don't even think it was 6. I think it was like maybe 4, maybe 5 a.m. I would say about 4 a.m. That's what I remember. It's about 4 a.m. Now, I didn't want to ask them where I was going. This was what was crazy. But something in me was, was telling me that they would let me go home for my birthday. How crazy was that? <laughs> okay. Now, I still had some time to do. Um, but I thought 
And I wanted to hold on to the thought. It's like half of me said, nah, why would they do that? <laughs> There's no reason. They don't do that. They don't let people out on their birthday. But then there was the other side of me that didn't want to ask because just that little bit of hope was enough for me. It was enough. It felt good. It was almost like almost like getting high, <laughs> you know? You got high for a little while, and I was, I was floating, and I haven't, float, I haven't floated in quite a while. And I, was, I floated, and what they did is um, the uniform I had on was a beige uniform. I believe this, I think I was in Rikers Island. I think I was in Rikers Island. Um, I'm sorry, guys. Yeah, I was in a few places, so I get, I get confused. And I've been to the island twice, so twice or three times. I think it was twice that I spent a significant amount of time there. Um, but they brought me, I remember I had beige, a beige uniform and those were adolescents, okay? So he brings me into a room, into another cell. He actually brings me, brings me upstairs. Yeah, it was Rikers Island. I know, I remember now because they sent me to the adult ward. So when we got upstairs, um, the adult uh, section, they took, sent me to nine main I forgot where I was before. I think I was like six main or something like that. They sent me in nine main. Nine main was adults. And when I got up there, before I got there, they, they put me in a little cell, a little room. And they gave me, it wasn't even a cell, I think it was a little room. And they gave me, they told me, take off, take off that uniform. Take your clothes off. And I said, and they gave me another set of clothes in green, dark green. So at that point, I knew what my birthday meant. My birthday meant that they were taking me out of the adolescent building or the floor, the adolescent floor, and bringing me to where the grown-ups were. Now, of course, I was scared because I didn't know what to expect in the adult ward, the adult, the adult, adult dorm, except adults, okay? And I was still a kid. I, I just turned 21 years old going from 20 and then years before that you know life was a shambles for me man like I had never grown up I was getting high and living with mom like zero responsibilities I had no kids I had a job that I ended up screwing up a good job I never owned a vehicle at that time I didn't have my own place to live I didn't have a house or an apartment I had absolutely no one who depended on me. I depended on my mom. And that was it. So it was just, that was it. That was my life. So now the adolescent uh, dorm, now I learned this later on, was worse than the adult dorm. And it's like that pretty much everywhere. That's why places like Spotford in the Bronx, I don't even know if Spotford is still there. Um, and some of these uh, juvenile um, places, these juvenile halls, they're notorious, man, because these kids have no concept of, uh, I know because I was there, so I'm not telling you what I'm thinking other kids think or what they, I'm telling you what it was I felt. I felt like no matter what I did, they were going to treat me like a kid. Think about it. Okay, so you have a kid, kid goes, breaks a, a window, they call the cops, cops brings him home. He's in trouble, you know? Um, jumps a turnstile, gets a ticket. It was the grown-ups that get arrested and go to jail and go to prison. So kids have this, almost like this, uh, <clears throat> this complex, this like superiority complex or immortal complex I don't even know what kind of complex uh, and, and what it is is they think that invincible there you go they feel like they're invincible and I remember when I was up to no good I used to tell everyone because people used to tell me yo man you keep doing that man you're going to get locked up man you're going to end up in jail you're going to end up doing this gonna... and I remember telling people on a regular basis man I ain't never going to jail Man, I ain't never going to prison. I remember saying this like it was yesterday. I'll tell you what else I also remember. I also remember saying that and it feeling like it was like within the next couple of weeks that I ended up getting arrested and uh, for the first time and doing a bid. 
doing my first bid, you know? And um, so when they brought me up, they brought me up to the adult building and they brought me up at 4 o'clock in the morning. So now I'm nervous as hell because these are grown-ups now. I'm in, I'm in a prison now with grown ass men and it, that's it there's no more there's no more segments and it's not like okay these are the 20 year olds and the 30s and the 40 no man these are the 21 year olds all the way up to the 80 year olds that's that's what you had there so you had serious grown-ups and you had a lot of people who had done been doing time for many years you know so when i got there to that building and I remember waking up, everybody waking up and us going to chow and stuff. And I remember feeling um, pretty nervous, pretty nervous. And, but what I did notice, what I did uh, realize is that um, the adults seem, the adults seem a lot um, friendlier. I had a lot of them that came up to me. Because I was young, 21 years old. So in all actuality, they really didn't mess with me. They didn't mess with me. They um, if the ones that, that were starting to trouble were the adolescents and they and they were younger than me. So it was like the 17 and 18 year olds that that were, you know, messing with me. You know, I don't even know if we had 17. I think it was 18 on up. So it might have been from like 18 to 21. Then once I hit 21, then they moved me up. I could, it could have been, you know, younger. I don't know. I would have to do research. I just don't remember. It was a long time ago. Um, but I remember uh, some of the first people that I got real cool with, I remember it was these two guys. At that time, they had to be, they had to be in their 50s already at that time. Okay? So... And I still have pictures of these guys. I still have pictures of them. And this was what was crazy. It was a black dude. Um, I think he was an old school nation of Islam, if I remember, if I remember correctly. And tight waves, glasses, really proper. And then this crazy ass white dude. And I have their names too with the pictures. I gotta find that stuff. But but this was what was interesting about them. The two of them, they, why they hung out. They could sing. The two of them could throw down. So now there was a few others that were there that they would do the doo-ops, you know, and they would do stuff like little Anthony and the stylistics and the Dells and the temptation. They would do a lot of a lot of these, um, the, and people would gather around in the day room, and they would sit there, and there would be others that would join in, and that's when I first got a taste of really, really good singing. Now, me growing up, I was, I always loved to sing. That was my whole thing coming into the whole music business was I wanted to be a singer. This was before rap even happened, you know, so I wanted to be a singer. I used to sing songs like Ben by the Jackson 5, Michael Jackson in particular. Um, and I was pretty good. I had zero training. I didn't know anybody that can sing. I didn't have anybody that can tell me, yeah, that's cool, but you went off. Your note went off. So what was so crazy is there was a couple little songs that I, that I knew. And I remember we were messing around and we're hanging out in the day room. And they asked me to sing something. And I think it, I don't remember what it was that I sang. But they looked at me and they're like, yo, man, you got a pretty good voice, man. They said, why don't you try this? And they started to give me lyrics to some of the songs, you know, like Earth Angel. Um, I'm on the upside, outside looking in. I forgot who sings that. I will have to find. But. They started giving me these lead vocals because I had a real high-pitched voice. And they started to teach me how to... I had a pretty good key, good ear with, key, with uh, notes. I can hear notes, even now. A lot of these freestyle artists, 
Even my own, I hear the second they go off, whether they go sharp, whether they go flat, and I can let them know. A lot of times when I'm behind the board, if I know one of the girls is going off key, I know that I know to bring down that mic a little bit. So I know how to do it. So I have a good ear with that. So nobody can fool me on that. I don't need to be over there singing. I can hear them in a second. Everybody. From the best of the best of, you're know, talking about freestyle because I listen to these people doing sound check also. So I hear the real them, you know. Um, and, uh, and, and just to throw this out there, and I know it sounds biased. I think my wife's way at the top of the great singing chain. Sounds biased. But her ear is phenomenal. And anyone who, and the things that she could sing, other things, not just her songs. She could sing Spanish. She could sing gospel. She could sing R&B. She could sing freestyle. She knows so many of the artist's songs. And some of them, she sings them just as good as they do. Maybe better. Okay? And I know it sounds fi- biased because it's my wife. But, no, she's got an incredible ear. And she's on point. Uh, <clears throat> a lot of people think that she's singing, that she's lip syncing. Well, they don't. Because she's very loud when she talks. But listen to her life's uh, performances. And you'll see. She sounds just like the records. But listen carefully. Listen to her talk and then listen to her sing because she'll talk in between her songs and you'll hear what I'm saying. But anyway, so this became a regular thing. And I used to um, I used to be with these guys and I would sing with them. And, uh, and then... Uh, um, when I went upstate, when I finally went upstate, now I'm mixing up a couple of times, a couple of bids, because I have some people that I met in some joints, other people I met in other places, and then when I finally went upstate, that's when we had our own little crew, and we used to go into this little, they had this little elevator section, and the CO used to let us go in there, because it had this cool echo, and it was private, so we could sit in there, and we could sing, you know, um, and that's when I started first writing, like, R&B songs and stuff like that. So, but um, but yeah. So anyway, just really interesting, uh, interesting story. But you know, so I ended up uh, was very blessed to end up <laughs> getting into the adult uh, building, and um, at that point, I didn't have no more problems. It was no. If anything, a lot of these brothers were encouraging me, and they were telling me that, hey man. You're good. You don't belong in here. You know. You know what I'm saying. Um, it was the adolescents that want you to mess up. They want you to to uh, to come back in, and you did. A lot of times you did, and you seen them come in. You know how many times I've spent some such long times in city buildings. I'm talking about the detention before being sentenced to go upstate, where I've seen people get out. Now, they will be in the building, like, let's say, Queen's House or whatever, and be diesel, like, working out, eating, looking good, you know? They get released, and 30 days later, I see them coming back through the door, man, looking like freaking, what the hell? All <laughs> oh, cracked out, because remember, it was during the crack epidemic uh, when I kept going in and out, you know? So, but, uh, but yeah, man, so, yeah, pretty, uh, pretty interesting, pretty interesting. Let me tell you something, man. I've said this before and I've told people, I don't glorify prison. I don't. I really don't. I don't glorify it. But I don't have any regrets. Me personally. I don't say to myself, oh, man, I wish I never went to prison. Mm, no. I don't. I, 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 I don't say that, I'm saying. I believe that it, it, it was a huge, huge part of my life. I believe it created a lot of the morals that I have in me today has to do with that. Now remember, prison is what you take out of it. Not everyone can do prison. Some people go to prison, come out exactly, sometimes worse than the way they went in. I used it to my benefit, you know, 
I didn't let the time do me. I did the time. So I, I made sure I went in there and I benefit. And I try to tell a lot of people, and I know people that have, you know, kids and stuff that are, are locked up. And, you know, and I've always tried to encourage people, you know, and say it's not the worst place in the world. Only because of my experience. Not that everyone, not that doesn't happen for everybody. You know, people could end up going in, coming out and being even worse. They become institutionalized and they really can't help um, being on the outside. And they end up, you know, creating some, making some serious uh, mistakes and never coming back out. So, but anyway. All right, guys. So, listen, that's it uh, for today. I appreciate you listening. As always, again, this is uh, episode 90, man. Congratulations. Everyone who hung in there, if you if you listen to all 90 episodes, hey, I got to give it to you, man. <laughs> what I probably got to do is do a, a quiz. <laughs> do a quiz. See who's really listening, man. Give away some, uh, some money or something. <laughs> but uh, so I'll give away some toilet paper. How's that? Anyway, guys, so listen, uh, be safe. I'm outside, by the way. I don't know if you can hear the crickets. Um, Very comfortable night. I'm going to go inside now. Um, Have a great night. Stay safe. Please stay home. No reason to be out there. Uh, We're going through a crazy time in this world. And, you know, I pray that um, everyone gets through this. And um, we can, you know, move on with our lives. This is not the way to live for any of us. So, okay, guys, uh, be cool. God bless and uh, good night, freestyle. Before I lay me down to sleep, I pray to hear a freestyle beat. For if I die before I wake, I hope to make it to the break.